Hi guys. I was walking down the street of Toronto with this money plant and uh, everyone thought, everyone was looking at me weird and I think they thought it was a marijuana plant. Kind of looks like that. But the rumors may be true. I'm high all the time! Hello everyone, welcome to Depression to Expression. My name is Scott. 10 unhelpful thinking styles. There's a PDF below, okay? Feel free to download it, stick it on a wall, download it on your phone, make a poster, blow it up, put it in a binder for school. And what I want you to do is every time you have some negative thought, some situation arises and your thoughts are all <laughs> which happens. If you're a human being, this happens. Look at the sheet. Think about the 10 things we're gonna talk about here because if you are a human being, all of you experience this kind of thinking. Call it negative thinking, unhelpful thinking. The point is, we're gonna go through these together and in the future, you're gonna notice when you're thinking like this. When you're thinking doesn't benefit you at all, when it is not useful, when it does not add value to your life. You're gonna notice these thinking styles and then you're gonna think of a situation or event differently. That's what CBT is. That's cognitive behavioral therapy. That's all it is. Having a situation, thinking about it one way, and then saying, oh, I can think about this differently in a more positive way or more helpful way. Does that make sense? So we're gonna go through 10 of them today. The PDF is in the description for you to download. And uh, I hope you enjoy. Everybody thinks a lot, but the thoughts aren't always good. So we gotta change the way we think. Cause it'll make us happier people in the end. Number one, all or nothing thinking. <laughs> right here, black and white thinking. We've all done it before. An example, a lot of you are in school, university, college, elementary school, even high school. You fail a test. You say, I failed the test, there's the fact, therefore, I am stupid. That is black and white thinking. There is no gray area there saying, I failed this test, but previously I passed so many. I did well in that social studies exam. I did well in that sex ed class. I could label the vas deferens. I could label the testicles, the urethra, the penis tip. I could, I could label the ovaries, the vaginal wall, the openings. I could do all of that. So I don't want you to discount the positive there. It's, life isn't black and white. There is so much gray, okay? So that's number one. Number two, <laughs> sex, sex. Number two is overgeneralizing, okay? An unhelpful thinking style and we've all done it and I have some notes here. What are my examples? Yes, here's one. Here's an overgeneralization. This is just terrible news and this is kind of what the news does to you and does to people. You see a news article, this is where teenagers literally watch someone drown and don't help them and laugh. So you think, okay, I'm gonna overgeneralize. Those teenagers are assholes, therefore all teenagers, all millennials are assholes. That's not the way it works. You go see a basketball game. You go see a basketball game. And you notice, man, there's a lot of tall people on the court. No. Let's take it one step further. There's a lot of black people on the court. Therefore, I'm gonna overgeneralize, all black people must play basketball. Do you know what I'm saying? I didn't push the boundary there. Overgeneralizing does not, it, it completely skews fact from fiction. All right, there, it doesn't make any sense. And this is what the news does, guys. You see an article and you, and you, you label something and then you put that label on everybody else. It's not fair. Number three, I don't wanna get into too much detail here, but everything we experience in life goes through our belief system. And here's a pretty extreme example. If you believe in, in God, and you believe that God intervenes with everything and he has a plan, well, everything you experience in life is going to come through that God prism, that God filter and say, oh, the trees, the sun is out today, the trees are here. Yeah, God likes me today, or, you know, uh, there's been tornadoes here and this many people died. Well, you know, 
It's all in God's plan, right? It, it goes through your belief system. When you're upset with something, or you're offended by what someone said, or what, something, or what someone did, or a, again, a news article or a YouTube video, if you're offended, think about, you know, what thought is going through my mind? Did this person challenge my belief system? And if so, what is my belief system? Is it, is it actually factually wrong? Is it actually right? Are they telling the truth? Are there statistics behind what they are saying? And I just, it's not my truth and I can't believe it. Does that make sense? So everyone has a belief system. The, the reason we get offended and upset is things challenge our belief systems and make us feel very uncomfortable. Like everything you've ever believed in your whole entire life is now wrong. And it's extremely difficult. And again, just notice it. Just notice it and then you can take it to the next level. Okay, what would be a better way to think about this situation? Number four, magnification. We've all done it. We've all done it, exaggerated a certain event. Say you're at, let's say, work or school and you're doing a presentation and you stutter. Okay, I remember, I remember so clearly I was doing, oh man, what was, Anne Frank? I was doing a presentation in English class in high school and I was so nervous. My, you could see my legs, my knees were going like this the whole time, the whole time. I get back to my seat, my buddy Bill's like, yo, what's up, shakes? I'm like, oh my God, I was so embarrassed. I couldn't let go of it for a week, two weeks. I just kept thinking about it. Overgeneralizing that everyone thought I was some freak. Everyone thought there was something wrong with me, that everyone outside the class was going to be talking about it, making fun of me, talking behind my back, saying, Scott's some shaky need freak. No. When, when you're overgeneralizing certain situations, um, ask yourself, will this matter in a week? Will this matter in a month? Will this even matter in a year? If you stutter during a presentation, if you fall over in front of a million people, is that really going to matter in a year? People forget. New things come up in their lives. New things come up in yours. That's life, man. So try not to, try not to magnify and exaggerate situations or embarrassing situations, anything that you go through. Number five, this is a huge one, absolutely massive, and it's emotional reasoning. This is what we do. This is why there are so many problems in the world. Believe it. This is why murder happens. Did you guys know this is why everyone's in jail? Because people think with emotion. I want to murder that person because I am angry. Why else would you murder someone? I want to take revenge. Revenge is so emotional. You want to murder, okay? Logically, if we, if we took emotion aside, okay, if I kill that person, I'm going to go to jail for the rest of my life and I won't be able to see my children and I won't be able to eat McDonald's anymore. Okay, I shouldn't do that. Emotion really motivates us to make bad decisions a lot of the time. A lot of the time. Guys, suicide is so complex and such a tragedy. And it is brought on and it is attempted with obviously emotional reasoning. I feel depressed. I feel depressed. I feel like I will never be happy again. My life is worthless. All emotion there. Therefore, the best thing I can do is to end my life. Right? Understandable. That in that situation, you cannot see an end. It is all emotional reasoning. There is no logic there saying, oh, okay, a year from now, if I try medication, if I do this and this and this, I could feel better. Five years from now, I could be so happy. No, it doesn't work that way. Emotional reasoning, I want you guys to really think about um, that unhelpful thinking style. You need to look at the logic of the situation. Be a Vulcan. Number six should statements. This is massive. This has made a, a huge difference in my way of thinking and my life in general. When you, when you do something, or when you're looking into the past, because should is always used in the past, I should have done that. That, to me personally, creates instant regret. I should have done it. I, I didn't do it. I should have. Therefore, what I did was a failure. What I am doing my best to do, and I invite you to do it as well, is say, instead of should, the word should, use next time I will. 
When you say next time I will, then you're, you're looking forward to the future. You're making a plan. When you're saying I should have, you're looking into the past, something that's already been done. What's there to do? You can't plan for what had happened. It's already done. Next time I will creates a plan for you. So get rid of that word should, and especially labeling other people. He or she should have done that. Why didn't they? They should have said this. They should have done this. Labeling people, trying to control them with that word should. Doesn't work. Next time I will. Done. Number seven, another huge one. This is huge. How many times have I said that? Um, what, what is it again? Labeling. Labeling. Not labeling others. Well, this is part of it. Okay, labeling others, you know, we talked about the teenager thing. All teenagers are assholes because I saw an asshole the other day. No, I want to talk about labeling yourself. I am. How do you label yourself? And this is huge. I am depressed. I am anxious. I am schizophrenic. I am bipolar. What does this do? And I've, I've done a... a Why'd I point there? I've done a video in the past about this word, these two words, I am. Labeling yourself with a mental illness, I don't think helps your recovery or, or helps in any way. When you say I am, that it's almost like I have. This is part of me, which is okay, but I prefer saying I'm feeling. Because saying I am means I am depressed, that means you're... It's part of you. It's there every single day, every single moment. Where in reality, we know that emotions come and go. Depression comes and goes. You don't have a panic attack 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Impossible. Anxiety comes and goes. Depression comes and goes. Unwanted thoughts come and they go, just like clouds in the sky. What I'm getting at is if you say I'm feeling depressed versus labeling yourself saying I am depressed, the feeling, just saying the word feeling, means it's not part of me. It's a feeling. Emotion, motion, they come and they go. Therefore, just changing your vocabulary around this, vocabulary, vocabulary around this, helps me so much and I'd, I'd invite you to do so. The next one here is personalization. And if I could be a little sentimental for a minute, this one's about putting the blame on you. Something about people who suffer from depression and are mentally ill or have, have some kind of mood disorder feel like the world is on their shoulders. And I bet you feel that way. You feel like everything is your fault. And it, it creates this compression and depression in you. You're holding so much up all of the time. People don't like me. It's because it's my fault and I'm not a funny person. I didn't get the job because my interview skills suck. Therefore, it's my fault. I messed up that meal because I'm a shitty cook and damn it, it's my fault that I didn't watch more Chef Ramsay on TV. It's always my fault. And guys, let me tell you something. Depression is not your fault. Having an anxiety disorder is not your fault. It's not. And it doesn't help you continuing to say that it is your fault. It's not. You're not choosing. You didn't put your hand up at birth saying, yeah, I would love to suffer from depression for a good 10, 15, 50 years. That would be really fun. No, you don't want this for yourself. It's not your fault, okay? So when those thoughts come in, saying it's my fault, it's my fault, just notice it. Look at the logic saying, you know what? It's not my fault. It's not my fault I didn't get the interview. I practiced, I did my best, I knew all the questions, but maybe they just weren't hiring at the time. Maybe they had a better candidate with more experience. What can I do about that? Right, let's look at some logic. Number nine, jumping to conclusions. You are not a fortune teller, guys. I hate to break it to you. And when you go to these fortune tellers, they're all bullshit. They can't predict the future either, all right? No one can. Therefore, notice in your thought patterns 
If you're maybe about to go out somewhere, if you're preparing, I don't know, I'm going to go back to an interview, right? If you're, if you're go about to go to a party and you, you're replaying in your head what it's going to be like. Okay, he or she will probably be there and, you know, they'll have shrimp uh, and they'll have some caviar and, you know, I bet they'll have that red wine. They'll probably have some white too. Oh, they'll, yep, yeah, they're going to have the, uh, the air hockey table and the pool table and, uh, you know, in the corner, that's where they're going to, you know what I mean? You're, you're creating a scene. You're predicting the future. And you know what? That makes you anxious, doesn't it? Because you want to know everything. Anxiety is sometimes the fear of the unknown, right? So of course we want to put the pieces together, but you can't. How to be comfortable with the unknown, that's a whole other video, and there's a lot on this channel about fortune telling and about um, anxiety, so please feel free to watch them. In this video, I just want you to notice when you're trying to predict the future and jump to conclusions. Number 10, disqualifying the positive. Oh my goodness, if... <sighs> Human beings love doing this, right? Let's focus on our failures. Where did we mess up? Where did we go wrong? Let's think of the positive a little more. And this is so crucial when we talk about recovery, guys, because you could have made it so far in your recovery. So far. Maybe you haven't had a panic attack in a week. Okay? Maybe you went to that party that you really didn't want to go to because you suffer from social anxiety, but you did it anyway. Fuck yeah. Right? But you'll come home from that, just going to use the party example, and you'll say, I only spoke with one person and I was so quiet the whole time. Oh, that sucked. Yeah, I, that was shit. I failed. Where's the positive? You went to the party. You did it, right? You didn't get the job doing the interview, but you went to the interview. Yeah, you have some great interview experience now, right? The failure is experience, or whatever that quote thing is. Let's not disqualify the positive, guys. Look to the positive. There's always two sides to the coin, all right? Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. These were the 10 unhelpful thinking styles. I've wanted to do this video ever since I started the YouTube channel. And I don't know why it took me this long, but, excuse me, I'm gonna puke. Um, but thank you for tuning in. Hmm. Ooh, sorry. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, if, if, if you wanna download the PDF, again, it's in the description below. Please message me, please comment if this was helpful to you. I know we've all thought this way before. So the point is, when you find yourself having these, this kind of unhelpful or errors in thinking, notice it, try to change it up. That's all. Thanks, subscribe if you're new. Um, please comment, like the video, and thanks so much, guys. Stay strong and keep being you. Everybody thinks a lot, but the thoughts aren't always good. So we gotta change the way we think. Cause it'll make us happier people in the end